rain that we do need it but um, it is a little you know hard to drive these days but thank thank the lord we're here and we're ready to worship him um just wanted to read uh psalms 23 uh, verse 1 which is a very uh, famous right verse the lord is my shepherd i i lack nothing he keeps me lying down in green pasture he leads me beside quiet waters he refreshes my soul. We are here today to have the Lord refresh our soul and ready to worship Him and ready with our hearts because of Him we are here, right? So at this time, let's go in Lord in prayer and be thankful and be ready for today. Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, for your wonderful blessings, for all your love you have for us, Lord. We are so thankful, Lord, because, Lord, of you we are here. We ask, Lord, that you open our hearts, Lord, that we leave anything that is bothering us aside, Lord, and, Lord, that we are here ready, Lord, to glorify your name. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask for those who couldn't be here, who's, for those who are watching online, Lord, and for those who are here, bless each and every one of them. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, at this time, um, I'm going to ask Brother Nathaniel to come up so he can read uh, the passage for today. Good morning, everyone. This time we will read Luke 1, uh, verse 26 through 38. The word of God says, Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He, shall, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Then, then the angels answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the main, ser the main servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. God bless you all. Good morning to everybody. Good morning out there to everybody who's watching. Our God is a wonderful God, is he not? We, we need water, and he brings us water. We need safety, he brings us safety. Whatever we need, we, we, we know we can always depend on him. Let's start off with that one that says, because of you. <clears throat> There's a place.
are more than welcome to please be seated and praise the, the name above all names, all right, Jesus Christ. This time we're going to give uh, the time for the offering and our tithing to the Lord, which is also part of glorifying the Lord as well. Um, and also we're going to also have the Lord bless this, this tithing. I'm going to ask Brother Nathaniel to come up so he can help us and pray for the tithing. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed day and for all your protection that you have provided us, Lord. Um, thank you because um, we are here to worship you and learn about your word, God. Help us strengthen our love towards you, Lord, to love you with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our strength, Lord, so that we can remain close to you, Lord, and we don't um, leave off without you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, and help bless these tidings, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, you know, I, I was just uh, remembering, uh, many years ago, I had a small Nissan car where everything worked uh, on that car, except for the transmission. Uh, this car was an automatic, and it, all the gears worked except for reverse. Uh, so everywhere we went, uh, we had to park in a place where there wasn't a car in front, because if there was a car in front, well, it would be problematic for us. So uh, whenever we would have a car that would park in front of us, well, my wife and I would have to get out and we'd have to push the car and somehow, uh, you know, manage to get the car out because the reverse wouldn't work. So I look back at those times uh, when I had that car and transmission didn't work. Uh, I didn't have the money to fix it. And uh, it kind of makes me laugh. But... In particular, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, uh, it is one that emphasizes that Christ came to put everything in reverse. In other words, the opposite of what people thought in that time. So, the Gospel of Luke emphasizes it, that Christ came to reverse everything. There's some commentators that call the Gospel of Luke the Great Reversal. He came to uh, establish a kingdom that was upside down. For example, I, I'll just give you one uh, example uh, to start off with. People thought, they had the notion that the Messiah was going to come and kind of, you know, revolt against the Roman government and uh, establish... Uh, a free people, because they were under the, the rule of, of the Romans. So they, they thought of the Messiah as a, as a political leader that was going to overthrow the government. And Jesus came with a different concept. Instead of being a Messiah who was going to change the government, he was a Messiah that changed the hearts of people. So the kingdom upside down, the kingdom in reverse. This is a kingdom where the poor is favored over the rich, the Gentile over the Jew, a kingdom where the first will be last, and where the one that's in the back of the line is going to come to the front of the line. This is a kingdom in reverse, where the sinner is justified and the religious are rebuked. Where to be great, you have to make yourself really small and insignificant and humble if you want to be great. This is the kingdom upside down. It is a kingdom where the little guy beats the big guy. A kingdom where a David beats a Goliath. Jesus came to put the world that was uh, kind of like the status quo. Well, he came to put the world upside down. Jesus came to bring good news for the poor and bad news for the rich unless they repent. It is a kingdom upside down where you have to Give to receive. Where you have to lose yourself in order to find yourself. Where those that are sad receive comfort and where the meek inherit the earth. This is a kingdom that is upside down where to be happy you have to carry a cross and follow Jesus. And where to live you have to die to self. You know, I had a car that, as I shared, didn't work in reverse. But as you look at the life of Jesus, he came to put everything in reverse. Jesus was a revolutionary 
who not only overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple, but also overturned all religious structures that were a burden to the people. So after the angel announces, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that she is going to conceive a child by the work of the Holy Spirit, she burst into a song of gratitude unto the Lord. It's called the Magnificat. And uh, let me just share part of it. In this beautiful expression of worship, she says, He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. And then he says, He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. So Mary, just like Zechariah, she was troubled when the angel Gabriel told her that she was going to be the vessel chosen for the Messiah's birth. Now, the angel did not trouble Mary like Zechariah was troubled. Zechariah was troubled when he saw an angel, but for, for a different reason. He was troubled because nobody was supposed to be in the temple there with him. Mary was troubled for a, a different reason. She was troubled and perplexed because God chose a simple and a poor girl to be a vessel. She uh, said that God had looked at the lowliness of her servant. So I want to share with you that in Galilee, everybody was poor. And they were poor because nobody owned any land. It uh, all the land, the farms, they belonged to the Roman government and also to the religious priests. So the Israelites, they were given a, a plot of land to work. They had to, to work it. They had to grow crops on it. So as they grew the crops, half of everything that they grew on the farm belonged to the government. They had to turn it over to the government. The other half, they could sell it. But on their way to the market, they could run into a tax collector, and the tax collector would collect taxes on the half that was left that they were taken to the market to sell. So the people were very, very poor. Uh, you know, it was forbidden for them to store uh, any kind of grain. They couldn't, you know, hide any money. Because if a soldier went inside their house and they found coins, they found money, or they found grain, they had the power to just totally destroy the house. They would demolish the house. So there was a lot of people that didn't have a, a stable job. In other words, a, a job that was like a career where they would uh, uh, get benefits and all that. There was a, no such thing. A lot of people didn't have a stable job. A lot of them were day laborers. Uh, sometimes you, you see them even today. They're standing at the street corner waiting for somebody to pick them up to give them work for the day. So <clears throat> during that time, people would go days without eating. Could you imagine uh, having such uh, food insecurity that you'd go days without eating? eating? And uh, Mary, uh, of course, was, was very poor, uh, and a lot of people at the time were poor. Lenders charge 50% interest if you want to borrow money, and a lot of people had to borrow money. They just couldn't make it. Uh, and then, of course, if you didn't pay, they would put you in jail. Uh, and so you see, in, in, in Palestine's economy, there was a wide gap. I mean, there was a really wide gap between those that were very rich on top and those that were very poor. Yeah. So there were those that, of course, were very rich. They got rich by taking advantage of people, by defrauding people, by basically ripping people off. And at the other end of the spectrum, there were those that were very poor. They were just barely making it. Uh, there, was, there was no middle class during that time. Uh, as Victor Hugo said, the paradise of the rich is built from the hell through which the poor people go through. So Christ wasn't born into the home of priests or an aristocratic family. He wasn't born in the circle of high society and well-connected people. 
Joseph, his earthly father, is described as a carpenter. And uh, at that time, you, you have to understand that people didn't work too much. The carpenters didn't work with a lot of wood. They were uh, mainly stonemasons. So you could say that Joseph was mainly a stonemason. In other words, he, he worked with mortar. He worked with uh, 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 rocks and all that in building homes. So Christ was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. Now, get a hold of this. Nazareth was a place that had a very bad reputation. You remember in the Gospel of John, Nathaniel says, there's a, a Nathaniel in the Gospel of John. Uh, he said, uh, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, he said it in a very put down way. So in other words, get all of this. Uh, Christ was raised in a ghetto. He, was, he came from the barrio. And that, that is what surprised Mary. The angel really didn't frighten her. It, it was what the angel said that kind of startled her. That is what puzzled her. And uh, now, according to the scholars of that time, uh, you know, the scholar says that at that time, all of the girls would marry between 15 and 17 years old. I don't know of too many dads today that would let their daughters marry when they're 15 years old. But that was a custom during that time. They would marry between ages 15 to 17 years old. That was a time when it was culturally accept, uh, acceptable for a woman, a young woman, to get married. It was considered that if a girl was already 20 years old, she was uh, an old maid. Como dicen en español, se le pasó el tren, ¿no? So Mary, at this time, she was between 15 and 17 years old. She was already engaged to Joseph. This was a one-year legal commitment before the marriage. Now, you think of how Jesus came to earth, and this is the time that we celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus. You know, God could have parachuted his son from, from heaven, but he, he chooses a young, poor girl as an instrument. So the proclamation of Jesus' birth came not to the great and powerful or to the religious, but to humble shepherds who care for the flock. Christ was not raised among the elites, the high society, and the wealthy. From Christ, they said, isn't, isn't he the, the son of Joseph the carpenter? Uh, and so Mary didn't understand how the birth of Jesus was going to happen, so the angel Gabriel tells her the following. Mary asked, well, how is this going to be uh, since I'm still a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So after the angel gave the news to Mary, she expresses her gratitude with a praise called the Magnificat. There she expresses her gratitude to God because now God will show his favor to the poor. In other words, she foresees a time when the poor are going to see a better life. And of course, we see this theme throughout Luke and Jesus in the first message to his home church in, in Nazareth said, that he had brought good news for the poor. Luke also tells of Lazarus, he was a poor beggar who goes to heaven and on the other hand there was this rich man who didn't repent and wanted to quench his thirst in hell. We also see the case of a poor defrauded widow who because of her persistence has an ungodly judge rule in her favor. So Luke tells his story from the viewpoint of people that are very poor and marginalized. And so today, uh, as we apply this to today, uh, we as uh, Latinos, and as a Latino church, we have to announce the good news to the multitude of people in our community who are poor. I mean, we want people to have Christ, we want people to have the good news, 
but we don't want them to have Christ and be broke. Uh, we have to announce uh, that there's a better life for them. Uh, and living a life, as John said, John said that, he had, that Christ came so that we can have an abundant life. So living a life of abundance starts, first of all, in first place, with the salvation of our souls. A believer who is redeemed and saved by the power of Christ will get ahead, he'll make progress, because he's not going to spend his money on vices like alcohol and drugs. We believe that Christ truly does change the lives of people. And uh, we believe that Christ changes hearts and gives people purpose and gives people an abundant life. That's what he came for. Jesus came so that we can have an abundant life. He gives us a better life because it says in 1 Corinthians 5.17 that if any person be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And so Christ, when he redeems us, when he saves us, he helps us get ahead in life. Uh, I, I know of immigrants who, uh, they come, you know, from another country like El Salvador or Honduras or Mexico, and all they had when they got here uh, was the clothes they had, the clothes that they were wearing. And, and uh, I, I see them now, they're, you know, uh, the Lord's blessed them. They, they didn't know the Lord when they came here, but here they found the Lord, and uh, God has blessed them, God has prospered them, and so we're thankful for that. So I really believe that when a person comes to know the Lord, uh, he makes a difference uh, in a person's life in all aspects. I'm talking about health-wise, I'm talking about, you know, financially, you know, I, sometimes we, we think that the, those beautiful waltz uh, that we hear uh, from, from Germany, we think that they're our German invention. Uh, you know, we hear uh, the waltz of, you know, Schubert, Mozart, uh, uh, Beethoven, and say, oh, well, that's from Germany. But actually, the waltz, el, el vals, uh, it was invented in Mexico. And it was invented by a guy, uh, he was from Guanajuato, uh, Juventino Rosas. And uh, he was a, a Mexican musician and composer endowed with a very special musical skill. He was a composer of the immortal waltz on the waves. But I think of, of him, and I think about his story of how different it would have been if he would have had Christ in his heart. I mean, he could have really been a, a game changer in, in the world of music. But instead, he died poor. He died destitute. His uh, liver and his body was destroyed because he was an alcoholic. And he died at the premature age of 26 years old. And I think, you know, I, I've studied a little bit about his life, and I said, whoa, what a waste. I mean, if he would have just known the Lord, just think of the difference uh, that would have made in this life. So I wanted to just share with you that I think an abundant life begins with receiving Christ. You know, you receive Christ, that's where the abundant life starts, but it doesn't end there. Uh, I think to really have an abundant life, we have to have two other things. Uh, First of all, the salvation of our souls, the, the promise and the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of sin, that, that's important, that's foremost. But then the second thing should be good health. Uh, God wants us to enjoy good health. Uh, and, uh, and so we as uh, Latinos, we have a lot of diseases that, that in particular, affect our population. And so we have to be very careful uh, of the kind of food that we eat because these diseases, they are particular to us. And, you know, one of them is diabetes. 
it's like a like a curse. Like a lot of Hispanics have that, you know. Uh, and so we have to be careful, uh, you know. Stay out of the tortillas and a lot of pan dulce and uh, you know greasy foods and all that 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 cause a spike in diabetes. And talking about COVID, you know that COVID affects Latinos more in a more disproportionate way than other uh, populations. So uh, we have to be very careful. By the way, uh, there's a box out there. Uh, at the end of uh, both services today, I want all these masks on, okay? There's 500 of them there. And there's, uh, in each package, there is, uh, there's five masks in each, each package. So I hope they're, they're all gone. Take them. Uh, it could save your life. There are also many Latinos who have Christ in their hearts, but they're broke financially. They have no financial peace. So in that sense, we have to enable our people, we have to empower our people, not just to be the cooks in a restaurant, but to be the owners of the restaurant. I mean, what's wrong with that? Si se puede, you know. <laughs> Uh, why do our people, I mean, uh, you go to any restaurant, you could even go to a Chinese restaurant and there's Mexican uh, cooks in there, you know, or Latino cooks in there. I said, what's up? I mean, this is a Chinese restaurant and there's Latino cooks in there. But anyway, uh, our people, that's a lot of work. And, they, and working in a restaurant, by the way, is a low-paying job. So remember to give a good tip whenever you go to a restaurant. Uh, but... I have thought about this, and my wife we, and I, we've talked about it a lot. Um, why is it? What, what, what is the difference? I mean, I, I, you know, I really believe we need to teach our people to be entrepreneurs and to dream big. I have always asked myself the question, what is the difference between the guy that flips hamburgers in a restaurant and the owner of the hamburger uh, restaurant? I don't think there's that much difference. Uh, I mean, wh what is the difference? Look, is it because is it that the guy that flips the hamburgers does he uh, does he work less uh, or more than the owner? No, I well actually I think the guy that flips the hamburger works harder than the owner. Uh, is is the guy that uh, owns the restaurant is is he smarter than the guy that? Uh, you know, cooks and hamburgers? I don't think so. Some of those uh, uh, young people that work in restaurants are actually very smart. They're going to school. Some of them are in med school. So it's not that the owner is smarter. So you ask yourself, well, what, is, what, what is the difference? Um, what, what is the difference? As, as you look at the, what is it that makes them different? Well, the only thing that makes them different is information. You see, uh, you ask yourself the question, well, does the, uh, you say, well, he, here's the deal. Uh, the reason the guy that owns a restaurant, the reason he, he owns a restaurant it, it, it is because he has money. Actually, neither the, the guy that's frying the french fries nor the owner, neither one of them has money. <laughs> In other words, most of the people that own businesses, they use other people's money. Uh, they, they don't have money, but the bank, I mean, it, it takes a million dollars to start a McDonald's franchise. Well, they don't have a million dollars, so they go and, they, they have the know-how. There you go, information. That is what the person that is the owner has that the cook doesn't have. He has information, he has the know-how, he, he, he knows how to, how to obtain the, the capital uh, to get a business started. So that's what we have to do. We have to empower people, uh, and we have to give them knowledge so that they uh, can get uh, the resources that they, that they need to uh, uh, finance their own project or their own business. Well, this is a, a subject for another day, but. 
I just wanted to share with you that Mary, in her, in her Magnificat, she saw a kingdom upside down. She saw a time when the last, the one who is last in the line, will come forward and be first in line. And she saw a better future for poor people, people that were destitute, just like her. She saw a better opportunity for them. And she saw her son that she was going to bring into this world as the one that's going to establish a kingdom that was going to put everything in reverse and that was going to enable people to have a better life, a better future. And so this is what we as a church are about. Uh, we are there to, here to empower people uh, to have a better life and a better future and to establish a kingdom that is in reverse because our values, our value system is in reverse to what the world teaches. If you don't believe me, just turn on the TV. I mean, our values are completely opposite of what's out there in the secular world. So, Lord bless you. Uh, we'll uh, see you next week. It's going to be the last Sunday before Christmas. God bless you. Uh, big hug to everybody.